Thank you. Um, yeah, I will try uh, to bring to you our approach how we um, fit both worlds of classic industrial components within uh, modern IT. It could be quite a challenge. And uh, yeah, we worked last year on a project which I will present to you. So who am I? I'm uh, Nikolai Buchwitz. I work for a small company based in Berlin called Enda. Uh, we mostly do monitoring and software solutions for federal agencies and also the European Commission and also um, for industrial customers like this one who's responsible for building hydrogen refueling stations in Germany. What is a project uh, I want to talk about? Um, we are monitoring hydrogen refueling stations in real time. Real time means within 100 to 500 milliseconds per metric. And uh, we are monitoring um, the refueling process um, of cars who come by and uh, refuel hydrogen. We do some sort of predictive maintenance um, to see uh, when components might be um, yeah, a failure or something uh, has to be changed, like a valve or what is mounted on such stations. Um, we've built a maintenance application, uh, which also has a task scheduler for all the staff uh, who is responsible uh, of taking care of these stations. So uh, every maintenance work on site is scheduled within a uh, big, I think, a web module which is integrated in the rest of the monitoring. We also um, do some sort of availability reporting and also um, for customers. We have uh, an app. Uh, so if you're a hydrogen fuel cell driver, you can look on your smartphone if the station nearby is working or you can do your planning. Um, and see where the next station is because uh, we don't have so much, such much stations in uh, Germany. You have around 100 stations by the end of the year. So uh, it could be helpful to see where's the next station and is the station working. <coughs> what is an HIS? Um, the HIS, a hydrogen refueling station, is a um, somehow complex uh, system, but you could bring it down to this. Um, basic components, like you have some source of hydrogen, which could be a large um, source or a tube on site, or even smaller tubes like, uh, you know, from school, from the chemical uh, lessons. Uh, there's always a compressor to uh, bring up the hydrogen to a certain pressure, um, because hydrogen is refilled with 700 bars in cars and 350 bars uh, for larger trucks or buses. So um, you need to compress the hydrogen and store it into um, two different um, steps. A middle pressure bank, where the hydrogen is stored around uh, 400 to 500 uh, bar, and also a high pressure bank where the hydrogen is at 700, 700 750 bar, uh, right to fill it into your car. Um, because you have to uh, cool it down, to uh, such a low temperature, you have a specific cooling solution, which is one of the components who are likely to fail in such a station, especially in the summer. And a dispenser, which is responsible for refueling uh, your car. You already know it uh, from, from classic uh, refueling stations where you can uh, refuel a car. Yeah, what's the situation in Germany? Um, we have at least uh, four manufacturers for now. Um, two of them are known as gas companies like Lindy and Elikit. There's also a Norwegian uh, Danish one and a new one from the Netherlands, which will build uh, stations next year. So we have um, 50 manufacturer model combinations um, because it's a fastly um, developing technology. Um, we get every year or two a new station, so we have to adapt new um, parameters, new um, control systems, and keep on track uh, with the technology. There's also um, the app I mentioned, so if you're a hydrogen driver, you already will know. Uh, it's called h 2 Life. Um, you can download it in the Play Store or on Google Play. This is a quick overview about the stations in Germany. You can see uh, they are located uh, in the west of Germany, uh, in where the big cities are, and also um, in the south, where the car manufacturers are, which are doing research on hydrogen cars, and in um, bigger areas like Berlin or Hamburg. Um, but there's also uh, a growing amount of stations in the eastern of Germany. The blue ones are on, on a building process, so um, they're highly likely to open this year or in the beginning of the next year. 
uh, in the region of Nuremberg. We have uh, one directly in Nuremberg and five around in Bayreuth, in uh, Bibelried, Fürth, Schnelldorf and Erlangen. Um, these are two stations. This is the one in Nuremberg and the freshly opened station this year in uh, Fürth, which is located at a Shell station because um, Shell and Total are shareholders of the H2 Mobility who built the station. So um, most of the stations were integrated into existing filling stations. The system. Um, we had the challenge to access industrial um, components and everyone who has ever talked to industrial engineers knows how complicated it could be to integrate um, existing control system because for them communication is like uploading a text file on a FTP server. But it's not data exchange uh, as we mean. We talk about APIs, JSON, MQTT, and all the fun stuff, and uh, they come around with plain text files um, with a uh, given format. So there is a company in uh, Germany, it's called Canbus, uh, who is doing very cool stuff around the Raspberry Pi community. They took um, the Raspberry Pi compute module, the compute module 3, and um, built little computers which can be mounted on DIN rail and also build a lot of um, extension modules like digital input, output, analog uh, modules or even gateways for the big industrial um, protocols like Profinet, Profibus or even Matbus. Um, they have patched the Linux kernel with real-time patches because you want to access the data on a high frequency like uh, 100 milliseconds or more, so uh, there was a lot of work to do, but it's all on GitHub. You can uh, find the sources, you can uh, find the schematics of um, the hardware, and there's always, um, yeah, what you can do. And there's also a maker kit, so if you want to build your own hardware on this platform, there's a um, housing and a platform you can build on. That's the system we built. Um, we mounted on each station three components. Basically, uh, the compute module, uh, it's like the Raspberry Pi, digital input and output modules for uh, some binary sensors or to um, control a pump on site if uh, we have some problem with water in the control cabinet and uh, to have some input outputs, and also a gateway module to access um, the field bus. Could be one of these three. Um, but there are a lot of more possible solutions. And after that, we are pre-processing the data on uh, the Raspberry Pi and sending it via MQTT, encrypted with TLS, into our cloud, where we're doing all the compute stuff like uh, reporting, uh, writing metrics to time series database, alerting, and so on. That's how the situation on site looks like. Uh, it's not a typical data center, but uh, a bit uh, similar. You have uh, the components like a router, power supply, and so on. And a very useless part here, it's a heating system for a control cabinet, but uh, modern computers produce a lot of heat, so we uh, never had um, the case we, we needed the heating system. All components are um, fully independent of the rest of the uh, station because um, we only have a power supply, but if the power supply is cut, we have bigger problems than our monitoring system, but everything else is fully redundant and um, independent from the rest of the system. The data collection uh, started with Isinga 2 on the Raspberry Pis. It's uh, why we also um, supported building uh, packages for the uh, Raspberry Pi platform for Isinga. But uh, we faced issues because we wanted to gather metrics at a higher level um, and also at 100 to 500 milliseconds with 200 metrics, it's not uh, something you want to do with a singer on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and it's, n it's not built for that. So we built our own um, data acquisition agent, which is um, basically a small Python program um, with a library um, for, for this hardware platform. And it's sending the metrics with MQTT uh, to our cloud, where Telegraph and InfluxDB is uh, responsible for handling all the metrics and writing it down uh, to the database. We're also um, writing aggregated refueling logs uh, into a PostgreSQL database, 
and um, also monitoring on-site the sources of hydrogen, nitrogen, and other gases, and uh, triggering um, refueling um, at, at uh, the vendor who is responsible for bringing new stuff. It's very easy to write such a program. Uh, it's a bit of Python code. You'll need uh, two libraries, like RevPy mod IO. It's um, the library is responsible to communicate with the RevPy platform and uh, Paho MQTT for the MQTT stuff, but you can also do um, other databases or write it to MySQL, PostgreSQL, or everything you want to run on your Raspberry Pi. It's uh, fully written in Python 3 because Python 2 is obsolete. Some of you uh, will hopefully have migrated everything to Python 3. If not, uh, it's time, I can say. And um, it's very easy to getting started with similar programs. Our visualiz visualization is done within Grafana because Grafana is very easy for us to bring in all metrics from different systems, like from our SQL database, also from InfluxDB, and also write own data sources for Grafana, because uh, we have a lot of data describing the stations, like um, a name of a sensor, where is the sensor located in the station, uh, what's the manufacturer of the sensor, and so on. And so we build a custom data source to make it possible uh, for our supervisor to access all the data within a specific dashboard. And it's so easy that our supervisors, who are mostly technical staff, start to use Grafana and build their own dashboards. And it's very funny to see a technician on site with a notebook on uh, the top of uh, the car, working on a station and looking at live values from the station with a custom dashboard he or she builds herself. And so it's very easy to start with Grafana. Um, we have built one basic dashboard for each station type we have, because uh, it's not similar what the hardware looks like. So uh, we have different sensors and um, types of stations. And we are bringing in all events on the station with uh, annotations, like refueling happened or alarm was raised on the station, uh, station is out of uh, opening hours, and so on. So you can easily access this kind of data with a new dashboard. We also build special dashboards, like our refueling archive, where a supervisor can uh, see all refuelings all over Germany or for a specific station, and a deep dive into the data and uh, do problem analysis uh, for a specific values he is interested in. And um, some months ago, the CEO asked, OK, I have seen all the cool dashboards. I want also one. Could I have a big screen in my office? And I want to see metrics like how much hydrogen we have sold uh, what's uh, the availability about all stations, and so we are building new dashboards for new parts of the company from the same data. It's an example da dashboard, um, what we have done with our data. Uh, you can see a compressor in the station. Um, it's like here, you have the um, pressure banks, and you can s uh, the slowly pressure goes up. And you can also see how the compressor is working, like up and down, up and down. You can see uh, what is actually happening inside of the compressor. And if something is faulty, you would see uh, one, one uh, panel goes down, and uh, you can uh, deep dive into problem analysis. This is how our refueling archive looks like. Um, we have aggregated all refuelings with um, beginning, end, um, where was the refueling, which type of station we are talking about. Is there a communication? Because when you're going with your hydrogen car to a station, there's an infrared communication between the car and the station um, to talk about certain limits, like the upper pressure, which is maximum, um, like uh, how full is the tank, um, if the car wants to abort the refueling process in case of an error or something. And, um, but it's also possible to refuel a car without this kind of communication. Um, but then the station um, works within certain boundaries, and so it's very important for us to keep track of this kind of information. Also, for the sales department, the most interesting part is how much hydrogen we have um, put into the car and how full. It's called SUC, state of charge. It's also a metric uh, electric drivers of batteries will know because it describes how full your car uh, was after the refueling process. 
And also there's a metric, was the refueling okay or not? Um, because if not, you can uh, click on the link and a deep dive into directly into the refueling process and see every metric, every spike. The blue line here is, uh, for example, the uh, cooling. We start around um, 20 degrees uh, ambient temperature and then it goes down, 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 down and the very spike at the end, it's nearly frozen. It's, it's a big problem uh, with the first generations of hydrogen stations because the nozzle was frozen in the car and in the winter it was uh, sometimes necessary to bring hot water and uh, put it over the nozzle to get the nozzle from the car and uh, such kind of, of um, failures we want to monitor and access uh, the data to, to yeah, change the, the limits of the, um, the station. We also um, built custom PNID diagrams. PNID is piping and instrumentation. It's like the language um, gas engineers are talking, like a schematic of something. And um, often they have big PDFs with uh, this kind of uh, information and want live metrics within uh, these plants. So there's a very cool plug-in. It's called Image It Panel for Grafana, where you can uh, put an image in the background and then uh, put live metrics onto existing images and see information visualized uh, with um, yeah, the information uh, you want to see. We are also using a singer. It's uh, like a typical day for me looks like. Uh, not only four men wear the helmet, there's also a singer helmet now. And uh, we are monitoring the usual metrics um, of each system, like disk, memory, temperature, and so on. But we are also monitoring the hardware system because uh, we only have one uplink to the plant control system. And if this uplink is gone missing, we have a big problem because we can't see anything. So it's a, one of the most important metrics to, to me for. And uh, so we have to keep track. This is always OK. There's always uh, something you have to update, like firmware, also on uh, industrial hardware. And it could be necessary because a uh, vendor introduces a new feature, and then we have to keep track that on our side the protocol is always um, the newest one. Um, we are also doing the notification with Isinga. Um, all metrics in Isinga we are talking about are from InfluxDB. So we're talking from Isinga to InfluxDB um, and checking against the InfluxDB and not, not locally on the RevPies. With this kind of information, we are able to notify our supervisors uh, via Telegram. Uh, we have several groups and direct notifications for the supervisors. This is how usual Isinga 2 dashboards look like. Um, you can see we are using Carsten's famous uh, Grafana plugin uh, with a lot of uh, graphs. This is, I think, for the LTE routers to see all the signal quality. Um, there are sometimes issues, even in, in bigger uh, regions. You can see when people are starting to work and when they finish to work because the mobile um, quality is good or bad, um, depending on its uh, neighborhood where people live or work. And uh, so we have to do some adjustments uh, on the routers. We also built a lot of custom checks for the Raspberry Pi platform, which will be released, I think, within the next weeks. So if you're planning industrial projects on the RevPy platform, keep eye on my GitHub account. Um, there will be a lot of checks um, to integrate in Isinga or other monitoring system who are able to understand the Nagios compatible plugins. Also, we are using uh, the map plugin. The map plugin was uh, yeah, one, one of the first components we developed in this project because we need to see where the stations are located and if there's a problem. And uh, especially with mobile, it could be really helpful, helpful to see where is a station, is a station neighbor, nearby, which also have a problem. So maybe it's a mobile outage or power outage. And um, we can also see ongoing maintenance work. It's especially interesting if you're putting um, these highways as a uh, layer on the map, and you can see, okay, uh, this is a region which could be problematic because all stations on this highway are currently under maintenance. So we can call a supervisor and say, okay, uh, we have to cancel maintenance work on this station because we need at least some stations working on this highway. We love dashboards. Um, most, most people in Isinga, um, I don't think, use dashboards as much as they could or should. 
Uh, I think a lot of you have seen uh, Michi's um, dashing uh, and using it for, for dashboards, but you could also integrate everything you can see in a single web as a dashlet. There's a small icon on top, you can click and say add to dashlet, and you can build dashboards with every filter or view every, nearly every plugin in a single web provides the functionality um, to build your custom dashboard. So we have um, to keep track of all the MQTT clients on our RefPies and can see is somewhere uh, MQTT client broken, like um, there's something wrong with our code because no code is perfect. Um, we can monitor the PLC connection um, to see if somewhere uh, PLC is uh, broken or the cable is not uh, putly, uh, put correctly in. And also we have written a custom plugin uh, for a single web to keep an eye on all the relevant metrics, like is the station available for the end user, um, is enough hydrogen in the tank, is the payment system working, and how high is the uh, CPU temperature of the RefPi, because in the summer it was very warm in Germany, and we have a lot of outages because um, the control cabinet is mostly located um, directly in the sun, and it's made from metal, and uh, so it could be very hot in there. So we have a lot of maintenance work with um, mounting fans into the stations. Yeah, also we are keeping track of downtimes. It's mostly for me to see um, if you are doing updates on um, some stations, which station could be affected. Um, our supervisors also have their own dashboards, like um, each supervisor sees the station he or she is responsible for, also on a map, and with the other relevant metrics like um, the connection to the PLC or some downtimes. It's fully mobile compatible, and um, mo I think most um, I think the modules with uh, the new Isinga web are mobile compatible um, because there's a lot of efforts to to bring yeah the best in in the CSS style sheet to keep it working on mobiles. Um, our custom module um, could be this if you have it. Uh, so, and um, if you count it 90 degrees, you can see more information because you have more space on the um, screen. Uh, we have a detail view for each station where you can switch the status of the station from auto to on off because sometimes it could be uh, necessary to keep a manual track of the status because the PLC is sending the wrong values or the station thinks it's not operatable because the compressor is out of um, order, but uh, there's enough hydrogen in the tank, so a customer could come by and refill. So we have to switch the station manually on. And they also see uh, how much hydrogen is left in the tank. There are actions like the plant monitoring of the manufacturer, where a supervisor can click and is directly linked to other systems. And there's also a possibility to fill in um, yeah, scheduled work like maintenance or when a station is broken, uh, the date when the station should be operational again. Um, also important, um, the last refillings at the station. So if there is any indication of um, failing at the refilling process, you would see a red X and a supervisor could uh, keep a close look at the station and see, okay, if it's a broken car or is there something in the station um, we should look at. We also built um, a big maintenance application into Isinga Web. It's very easy because it's mostly PHP code and uh, written in the Zen framework. Um, so I have a colleague who is uh, a Zen developer. He started to uh, rebuild the custom application where all maintenance work, all uh, reports, everything is done within this company and module for Isinga Web. So it's very easy to integrate your own applications. A few words on provisioning. This was my desk uh, when the first hardware arrived and uh, we asked ourselves how could we bring our own software onto like an IoT device because there's nothing like PXE. Um, there is no possibility to um, do processing like when I have bare metal. So um, we built it like a desk where we could all mount um, the hardware and started to sync and we found out that there is a default credential on every device and uh, we could scan 
the MAC address and uh, so on with a barcode scanner, put it into a database, and then we discovered Ansible. And Ansible is perfect because um, per default an SSA agent is running on each RevPy. So we are starting to work on Ansible and developed a lot of Ansible code. And now we have everything which is configured on this kind of devices in Ansible. There's nothing um, you could do manually. For everything, there's a playbook uh, and information in a PostgreSQL database, uh, which is um, yeah, deployed by Ansible uh, onto the devices. It's um, very helpful because sometimes hardware gets broken and you have to um, yeah, find quickly um, a replacement. So um, a colleague could take a new Raspberry Pi and put it on the station, press a button, choose a station on a touch screen we have, and then put on deploy, and I think one hour or so, the new hardware is ready, and it could be sent to the supervisor to mount it on the station. We also developed some uh, custom Ansible stuff for the RevPy platform, like uh, custom facts to keep track of the model, uh, of the module status, and so on. And it's also soon published on GitHub. And a very cool part, I think, is that we are doing some low-level stuff with Ansible, like um, flashing custom firmware images or even new images um, via USB on uh, the RevPies. There's a tool which could be used stand, um, standalone, but also with Ansible, because Ansible is Python code, and everything you could write in Python, you could use it in Ansible. So, um, to resume our project, we have around 80 stations for now. Um, we are gathering metrics within a resolution of, um, I think, 500 milliseconds at least. Um, we have five, 15 different HIS types and uh, with around 3,000 refuelings per month and gathering 20,000 metrics per second. And it's only possible because of great open source projects and I think you couldn't say it enough. Uh, thank you to all open source developers because there's such a lot of uh, free software could use and um, often people hear only if something is broken, but you should also thank you in advance and say, okay, it's cool software and um, yeah, thanks for having this. Thank you. How do you secure the, the Raspberry Pis in the in the on site in this metal box? I mean, it's 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 a possible uh, attack vector to get into the systems if yeah. there is some. It's it's secured by a lock, but there's also um, no physical access because uh, all TTYs on the Raspberry Pi are um, disabled. There's only a VPN connection uh, to our management network where uh, we can access these kind of devices. And even if you have access to the control cabinet, you can't really do something with the hardware besides dismounting it and taking somewhere. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my question would be, uh, you talked about having four vendors. Could you elaborate on the challenges you had to face integrating those four different systems with your, your solution? Yeah. Um, we have for vendors and for vendors who are, have different interests in, in this project because um, two of the four vendors are shareholders of the company, H2 Mobility. So they have a certain interest in uh, sharing this kind of data because um, it helps them to, to build better stations. And also we are gathering, gathering metrics um, they don't have. So they're interested in come to us and say, okay, can we have data? And there are other vendors who are interested in selling stations, but not interested in sharing information. So it could be very complicated to get all the information we want. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot about tactics and finding the right words to the right persons to get all the data. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, on one of your initial slides, you had um, a bullet point that you send metrics via MQTT and they use Telegraph. 
to go to InfluxDB. Are those two separate channels, or do you send um, telegraph metrics also out via MQTT? Uh, we are sending directly um, via MQTT um, the metrics with the Influx line protocol. So it's no JSON. So we somehow directly write, uh, writing to the InfluxDB via MQTT.